Hello, my name is Mike Fournier. I'm the superintendent of schools here in Bedford, and I'm happy and honored today to have with me uh, the six librarians from each of our six schools uh, here in Bedford. Um, we have a nice show for you today to talk a little bit about what's happening in our Bedford schools, uh, what our school libraries do, and who uh, is involved uh, in our libraries. Um, so to start, I want to, um, down to my right and your left, I'd like to start with um, Hattie Ferns. Uh, each member is going to introduce themselves a little bit, and then I'll give a bit more of an introduction after that. Hello, I'm Hattie Ferns, and I'm the librarian at Riddlebrook Elementary School. Hi, I'm Josie Garcia. I'm the librarian at Memorial Elementary School. Hi, I'm Angela Baldi, and I am the librarian at Peter Woodbury Elementary School. I'm Jessica Gilcrest, and I'm the librarian at Bedford High School. Hello, I'm Julie Cody. I am the librarian at McKelvey Intermediate School. Hello, I am Ann Detweiler, and I'm the librarian here at Lurgio School. So thank you very much, ladies, for being here today, for taking time out of your day to be here. Um, and also thank you to the community. Uh, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, not every school district in the state has a librarian at each school. Uh, we are fortunate in that way to have um, a certified professional librarian in each of our schools uh, to help with our libraries and help our students and, frankly, our staff. And so today, we want to talk a little bit about what librarians and libraries do in schools uh, in Bedford and for our district. And so while all of us in our community have the commonality of ha having gone through schools, uh, school libraries have changed a lot over the years, and they are not the same libraries uh, that we had many years ago. Uh, and so there are some differences, and I think um, we're in a place now where we can uh, talk a little bit more about that and find out what's happening. So we're just going to jump right in. So the first question that I have, um, and I think uh, Jess is going to take mm -hmm. this one, uh, and that has to do with what is the role of a school library uh, and librarians in today's sort of 21st century schools? Mm -hmm. So I'm actually going to take your question, I'm going to separate it into two. Okay. And because the role of a library and the role of a librarian has, there's definitely overlap, but there's definitely two things going on there. So the library is a space where it's an information resource center. Um, and in a school library, it's full of curated resources that is particular to that population in that school. Um, we offer independent inquiry and our collections foster curiosity. It's a space for growth and individual choice for students and faculty. It's a space to socialize, relax, rest, and reset. It's not always necessarily just doing schoolwork. Sometimes you just want to hang out with your friends, and that's good too. Um, it's a meeting place outside of library hours for school community groups like booster clubs and sports teams and things like that. So our library is used at the high school all the time, um, morning until night. Um, all of our libraries are welcoming and safe places. Students know that they're all welcomed in our spaces. And we're the biggest classroom in the entire school. Hmm. I have up to 150 students in my space sometimes during the day. Um, and every single student might be working on something different. They're not on one particular lesson or one particular grade level, but they still have adults in there to help support them with whatever that they're working on. May I make a comment about that? Yes. So I have the privilege of walking through the high school frequently, mm -hmm. and so I'll see students sitting on couches, mm -hmm. having um, conversations. I'll see students at computers. I see high tables. Mm -hmm. I see regular tables. I see some students that are in the stacks. Um, mm -hmm. So it seems like there's a variety of things that students do in the library that when I was in school, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. uh, you went to the library to study, to do research, uh, to look in the catalog drawer, mm -hmm. which I don't think they do Card that anymore. Catalog. <laughs> I don't think they do that anymore, so. Right, no, there's lots of choice within the space, and that's intentional, that's, that's no accident. Um, our doors are always open, and oftentimes it's extended hours. It's into the summer, it's into the late afternoon, and again, that's intentional so we can reach our entire population based on what they need. So that's the physical space mm -hmm. and sort of what that looks like in all of our schools, but then we are facilitating that physical space. So that can look really different. We facilitate all different types of programs, which might look like 
we work with student volunteers that do work in the library. Um, we currently have an IB art exhibit setting up in the library space for um, two days and an evening. I'm teaching information literacy skills, designing lessons with um, the PLCs, those are groups of teachers in the building. And I work very closely with the digital learning specialist in the building. So we facilitate programs in many, many, many different ways too uh, within the building. And that's not always direct instruction. We do a lot of flipped classroom um, things too because since there's one of me in the building and there's hundreds of classrooms going on at the same time, a lot of times I'll design curriculum so it can be pushed into a classroom and implemented by the teacher, but it's the content that's coming from the library. Um, we inventory and maintain our collections, which and for the high school that includes, and for some of our other schools too, not just the library collection, but all of the textbooks, novels, and equipment for the building. So for me, that's over 50,000 um, copies of print materials. So we maintain that we make sure that we have everything um, present and accounted for. And then it's our job to know our population. I need to know what's trending in a teenager's life. I need to know what's causing stress or anxiety in a teenager's life. I have to keep up with current events and social issues. In a nutshell, I need to be relevant in their lives. I am a lot older than a lot of the, <laughs> the teenagers in my space. And so it's my job to be in touch with the kids that are in my space and make sure that I am providing resources that are meeting them where they are. Um, so that is... No, thank you for that. Actually, I really like one of the last things you said, which is you need to stay relevant to the kids. And so uh, sometimes that relevance is how you interact with them and the resources you have, but also in the, um, the books and the periodicals and, the, and just the information you have available to them. Uh, because particularly at the high school level, students come to us with a variety of interests that could be within the curriculum, but could also be with outside of the curriculum, mm -hmm. maybe a special project they're working on or, or a current event. Um, and so to access those materials in the school, I think, is really important. Absolutely. And the clubs and organizations and all of the additional things that go on outside of the class curriculum is important to take into consideration with library resources, too. That's true. So thank you, Jess. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to jump to our second question. And our second question is for uh, Ann Detweiler. So mm -hmm. Ann is, as you know, the librarian at Lurgio, and we happen to be filming in her space. So mm -hmm. thank you, Ann, for, for opening up your library to us. And so one of the main questions that I have, and I think many people in our community have, is what is the difference between the school library and the public library? Because many of our families access both. And so how can we sort of easily differentiate the differences between the two? Sure. Um, one of the main ways that the big difference is um, schools and school libraries are considered to be non-public forums. And um, schools actually are for the use of teachers and students primarily. So that's why we're here to serve students and teachers and provide the resources that they need. Um, and also for the curriculum as well. And we also have the goal of creating lifelong readers. That's one of our main goals. And as Jessica said, keeping our collection current and making sure we're addressing the needs of our students is our, one of our highest priorities. Um, and so as certified school librarians, um, we've been trained to actually understand the scope and the breadth of literature right so of books that students want to read for our specific age level um, so i have at lurgio ages 12 to 14 so making sure that the materials we curate are age appropriate um, and often we have a lot of at lurgio we have a lot of um, novels for our classes like for example to kill a mockingbird um, we also have night um, we also started a new social studies companion novel project that we had to purchase a lot of books for. So um, in the school library, we really support the teachers and the students making sure we can pull in um, our, our readers and really keep them interested. Um, graphic novels are extremely popular with middle schoolers. Manga is popular as our um, adventure, mystery, horror. So all those are really popular and at Lurgio we do have a sustained silent reading class where students are required 
um, to have a book for fun to read. Um, and I also provide newspapers and magazines, so I really meet students where they're at to get them really hooked into reading. That's my goal. Um, also, so at Lurgio, we have a Booked for Breakfast Club, which is really fun, where students come every Thursday from 8 o'clock to 8.30, then all Lurgio students are welcome. And students can bring their breakfast, and what we do is we chat about what we're reading, um, and we chat about what we love about books, and we talk about authors, and we look at their websites. We also have authors that visit the school, and we, we've been doing that with um, you know, virtual visits. So we're very fortunate um, to support our readers that way. And then um, access is really important. The diff one of the main differences, too, because as a school library, um, we, we're here in the building, right? So parents don't have, sometimes parents can't drive their students to the town library. Because I ask a lot of students, I say, do you have a library card? And some say, well, no, I can't get there because maybe parents are busy working or maybe they're traveling or maybe it's, they're just unavailable to take their child to the library, to the town library. So we're very fortunate um, to have this beautiful space here and in all of our schools, we have very beautiful libraries and great resources to pull from to entice our readers um, to get our students to be interested and engaged in reading. Um, so that's, a, that's, that's why we're very lucky to have what we have in our schools. Um, we're also a safe and a welcoming place for our students as well because um, sometimes, you know, students might not feel comfortable in their large classes or they just might need a space just to sit on the couch and read for a little bit. And so we are that space to, to be available for students and staff. We also have a professional development collection um, that teachers use. Um, this week we've had an autism presentation created by seven, seventh graders. Um, they took it on themselves to educate their classmates about autism. So we had 100 students in here for a presentation that students created. So I was so proud of our students for doing that. Um, I also want to emphasize the importance of information literacy skills that we address at the middle school level, where my job um, is to make sure students have the skills they need to go to high school, because Jessica and I worked together. Um, we did a study skills session, was it two years ago, that we did a study skills session. So it's important that students know how to research. They can access online databases such as Britannica, ABC, Clio. Um, and EBSCO, so it's my job to make sure they know how to use those because we need to make sure students understand the importance of reliable information and we talk about misinformation and we talk about um, accurate information and we talk about Google and we talk about when it's appropriate to do social studies research with ABC Clio, which is a social studies online database. Um, right now we're doing a body systems research project with science and so Students are learning how to use print resources and create works cited pages. So there's a lot that happens in the school library. It's a dynamic space, as Jessica referenced. Um, there's never a dull moment. So I think, and we also have like games that are available for checkout because we have an advisory. I have an advisory. So there's card games. There's puzzles. So there's a lot of things that go into being a librarian and into a school library. And it is quite different than the, the public library. But yeah. No, and I really appreciate that because not only did you sort of answer the question, which if I can just really summarize quickly, is essentially your school library for 7th and 8th grade at Lurgio is really catered to that age group. Yeah, Like very that's much who so. you're catering mm -hmm. to. Yep. And so whereas I might find something on the New York Times bestsellers list for adults right. or in the paper or Barnes & Noble, when these students walk into Lurgio, they're seeing um, titles that are specifically designed for their age group and their interests. I also really appreciate the fact that you talk, to, talk about the instruction that librarians provide students to teach them how to do research, mm -hmm. to access um, the online resources that are available to them so that that knowledge builds, and we'll probably hear it from the elementary librarians, it starts at the elementary school and it works its way up to the, lib to the um, high school library to help prepare them for when they get into college. Correct, do these yes. Things. So yes, very much so. That's great. So thank you so mm -hmm. much for that, Anne. I appreciate thank you. that. Thank you very much. So um, the next question I think is headed to Hattie uh, at the end. Um, and that is, uh, this is just really interesting um, to me, this question. It's, what are the areas in which you curate materials for the library? And so, uh, you know, 
I don't know if you want to talk about the three areas that I've I identified, but I think there's definitely curriculum support. What are the teachers teaching and students learning? Professional development. Um, you know, we mentioned autism, so I'm sure there's resources in the libraries on to help our educators better understand students with autism and, and other things, and then student interest. So if you wouldn't mind unpacking that. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, hi, everybody. Again, my name's Hattie Ferns, and I work at Riddlebrook School. Um, I think one of the big questions is, how do the materials get into our library? Why do we choose what we choose and how we choose them? Uh, curriculum drives our library, but so does student choice. Um, we need our curriculum resources to go with our units, and that's why during SCTI, which is a week in the summer where um, the teachers work on curriculum units, uh, there's usually one of us there who is walking around, meeting with the teams, and asking them what they're doing. And then we go into our databases. We go into the publishers um, that we use, and we look for the materials they need. I can speak for myself. A lot of my collection was curated, curated on next-gen science standards, the social studies units we work on. And that's how a lot of stuff comes into play. Um, also, as uh, Anne and Mike were talking about, professional development. We're doing a lot with um, Mike Anderson, and we're talking a lot about kids and their emotions and what we've all been through for the past two years. And so we have lots of resources like that for teachers. We have sections of the library that are there for teachers to go and find professional development in print or online. A lot of our books are now multi-user digital books that if, you know, Susie in a second grade is researching Cheetah and Jimmy in second grade is researching Cheetah, you no longer have to have that one book. Everybody can be on that book at the same time. So as we all continue to say, libraries are changing. We have this database called Pebble Go, and it's a wonderful database for children. It has social studies, it has science, um, it's broken down into space, into animals. There are great graphics, it can read to the kids, it automatically cites for the kids if they're working on their bibliography. So again, libraries are changing, they're different. Um, the online aspect of our libraries are that you can go into any of our catalogs. You can go to our websites and see all the books and materials in our libraries. They're there for you at any time, 24-7. Um, our libraries support clubs. I have some book clubs at Riddlebrook, one for third grade, one for fourth grade. A lot of the books that we read in those clubs were student generated. In fact, the book club itself was student generated. They were at um, Molly's principal council and they said we'd love a book club and so we all got together and started one. Uh, some of the books, like Herbert's Wormhole, I never would have read in my life. It's a kooky graphic novel blend, but the kids love it. So I think there are different books for everyone and that's what we have in our libraries. Um, Hattie, may I ask you a yeah. question? So one of the things we talk about is that our libraries are designed to support teachers um, and students. So let's say I'm a fourth grade teacher in your school and I'm teaching a New Hampshire history unit. Um, and I feel as though there's a resource that would really help my students learn a component of New Hampshire history. And we didn't have it. Could I go to you as a teacher and ask you to order that? And is that something that you would curate and make sure that it's you know, well vetted prior to ordering it so that I could use that with my students? Absolutely, and I think that that happens often. And there are some books that we cannot get digitally, and so we have a fourth grade um, New Hampshire history. We have a fourth grade New Hampshire history cart, and that is checked out to the fourth grade. During that unit, it revolves around to all the different classes, but they will often find a book, um, whether they find it through um, you know, a teacher site or something, and they said, hey, we don't have this. Can we get that? And, you know, we purchase it. Of course, we vet it first. We make sure that it's appropriate for fourth grade. Um, but there's more and more materials coming out like that. 
um, and gathering them is what we all do. And you could also, the same could be said about students, and I think in a previous conversation, not recorded on TV, Angela and I had, uh, had talked once about how there's a group of students at the elementary school that love scary stories, mm -hmm. right? So they may come to you and talk about other scary stories that are available for sort of just choice reads. So the students come to you and ask you about those things? They do, and fortunately we have companies that we use like Capstone, which is for younger elementary. Um, we use Follett, which is a clearinghouse for different publishing companies. We use Abdo, and they will set the horror, you know, down at a level that, you know, it's not Stephen King, which <laughs> there's nothing wrong with Stephen King. I love those books. But, you know, it might be haunted castles of Europe. And it will, right. you know, show you pictures of the actual castles and tell you, you know, some of the stories. And, you know, you can see a group of children, one of the book, the children take it out, and then they're all sitting there looking through it. Um, so it is a lot of student-generated interests. That's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I appreciate it. So our next question is for Angela. So Angela is the librarian at Peter Woodbury. And uh, that has to do with how do librarians um, begin by, select, by selecting new titles and mm -hmm. weeding out old titles? Because mm -hmm. I imagine, you know, Jess had mentioned relevance. Mm -hmm. So if you're studying New Hampshire history, um, likely that is not going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're studying next generation science standards or if you're taking a look at a, a different type of literature that's coming out from a new author, mm -hmm. that's going to change. Sure. So how do you go about weeding old titles and getting new? All right. Um, actually, I have to say selecting new titles is one of my favorite parts of my job. Other than interacting with students, I love that part. But I think all of us use a tiered approach to purchasing new materials. and. The two primary considerations that we have are the curriculum and student interest. Like, what are those books that are going to grab students and make them those lifelong readers and learners? Um, so we all have professional resources that we consult. Um, our book jobber is Follett, and they kind of collate lots of professional reviews of books. So from places like School Library Journal or Horn Books. Um, Publishers Weekly, Kirkus Reviews. So that's one place where we can go and get professional reviews of titles that we're considering. Um, I think we also all look at um, award lists from the American Library Association, from our own state here in New Hampshire. Um, and these lists aren't something that we automatically go out and purchase every title from, but they're a guide. They're saying this is what is considered the best in literature or um, for children of the ages that we serve. And then we can take that recommendation and we can read the professional reviews. We can think about the relationships we have with our teachers and our students and what matters to them. And that can help drive our decisions. Um, when we were talking about this, uh, Josie described a library as a living, breathing thing, which is absolutely true because I think my library is actually different at least from week to week, possibly even day to day, um, because we're always acquiring new things. Um, sadly, we're sometimes finding things that need to move on. Um, so one example is a book about robotics is going to become outdated relatively quickly. Um, whereas you said, you know, something about New Hampshire history, that's going to stay mostly the same. Um, but in preparation for Earth Day this week, I pulled out a book on solar energy, and I saw it was published in 2007, which doesn't seem like that long ago, until I fact-checked three of the facts in the book, and they were outdated, because bigger wind farms have been created, or we have new technology for solar than we did. So. Um, I now know that I need to weed that book and buy something more um, updated. So the other thing we do is that we run collection analyses. I know this sounds kind of boring, but <laughs> we, have, not we have the ability to <laughs> we have the ability to generate reports about uh, the titles in our collection. And let's say, for example, I want to take part of my budget and update part of my nonfiction section. I can run a report that tells me the age of all of my titles. I can run a different report that tells me how often they're going out. 
and then I can consult these professional resources that are telling me this is the best of, and I can compare it against once I, what I have and say, oh, here, I can fill in the holes here and there. Um, so, you know, printing off pages and pages of reports to consult, um, you know, to help drive those decisions. Um, so as we all talked, it made me realize that so much of our jobs is about relationships, even when it comes to selecting titles and deselecting titles. We each have to know our school community very well. We have to know what their needs are. We all serve a range of ages, of um, reading abilities, of um, developmental um, stages. We have to know all of that so that we can tailor our um, book purchases toward meeting those needs because we're all fully committed to supporting the curriculum but really like giving our students access to information and making them excited about reading so that when they're our age they still want to <laughs> keep learning about the world right isn't that what we all want that is the basis that's our big mission in this district we want curious lifelong learners and that's what we try to do, so. That's great, Angela. Uh, the, the part that I think I want the community to hear and know is that it's not just a school librarian, or in your case, Angela, who's going through the stack saying, I like this one and I don't like this one. Mm -hmm. You're using data to determine the age of that particular genre, mm -hmm. um, what is supposed to be sort of where the, where the genre should be in terms of age and, mm -hmm. and the titles you have, mm -hmm. and then what's out there and what's available. And, I, and yeah. I remember back to what Hattie said a few minutes ago, which is you don't just purchase a title because you need a nonfiction book. You mm -hmm. look at it, you determine is it appropriate for my age group, mm -hmm. uh, sort of does it meet the standards of my school, what, do I have readers in my school that are going to mm -hmm. actively utilize this book? Mm -hmm. And so going through all those processes is helpful to realize that it is a multi-tiered system. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate how you put that. Um, oh, thank, thank you. you. And I will say, uh, sorry to add one more thing, but I just got some new books in, and the top shelf was cleared by the after the first three classes this morning, and that's when I know I've done my job right. Mm -hmm. Right When you've bought new books and you put them out and they're gone within days, that's when you know... Mm -hmm. Okay, the formula's working, like whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. So That's terrific. Yeah. That's terrific. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. I, I appreciate welcome. that. Uh, so I think the next question is for Julie. It is. Is that good? Okay. Yes. So th this one's an interest is interesting, and I and because I was principal at your school and saw you in action, I sort of know the answer to this, but I, I, I think everyone else needs to hear it too, of course. Given the continuum of readers and the maturity of students at your schools, how do students and parents navigate a just right book? And what I mean by that is, you may have 10 to 12 year olds in your school, but some of those 10 year olds are still breaking the code, and some of those 10 year olds are reading at the high school and college level. Mm -hmm. And you sort of have to find this balance of how do I meet all of their needs? So can you talk a little bit about that? I would love to. So at McKelvey Intermediate School, mm -hmm. I like to use the term good fit books, and as a fifth and sixth grade librarian, I serve um, nine to 12 year olds, and that is typically the middle grade um, book selection that I stick with, so eight to 12 year olds is what I target right there. But within that range, I do have the responsibility to provide curriculum materials and books that will help foster a love of literacy and at a variety of levels, which I think is what you are getting to. So I like to term that as good fit books. Um, I serve readers um, that will be accessing beginning level books. I serve readers that will access picture books. I serve readers that will access graphic novels. I serve readers that will access novels in verse and prose. And then I like to refer to something like this as a hybrid. So it's a combination of um, pictures and text or prose on in book. Um, all of the fifth graders, when they come to McKelvey Intermediate School, they book time in the library with their homeroom teachers. And they come in and we do a <laughs> lesson with shoes. And I call this a good fit book lesson. And what we do is 
we try to come up with ways that books and shoes are similar. And I love having this conversation with the students because they come up with all different things from some shoes are leather and some books can be leather bound. Some shoes are smaller, which might represent something that is more like a beginning reader book. Some shoes are a little bit bigger, which might represent a larger text. So we talk about what a good fit book is and then how we go ahead and determine what is a good fit for us. Because just like a pair of shoes, a pair of shoes is not going to fit every single person. When you walk into a shoe store, you have a variety of shoes you get to choose from. At a school library, it is choice, and they get to self-select the books that they want to read. So we talk about ways to navigate that, looking at the front cover. If it's a paperback, I encourage them to read the back of the text. And then I always encourage them to try a couple of pages. And nine times out of 10, the children themselves will say, you know what, this isn't a good fit for me. I'm not interested in this book. Maybe the content, the words are too challenging. It's not something that I gravitate towards, just like a pair of shoes. Some people might gravitate towards a fancy sparkly pair of shoes. Some people might not. So if it's not a good fit, then that book goes back on the table or back on the shelf. And the kids really do a great job at self-selecting titles. So that is a good fit book lesson that we do at the beginning of the year. We also have um, multiple book tastings throughout the school year. And that's when homeroom teachers will come in with their class. We have um, the library set up like a restaurant. I dress up like a chef and they each have a table reservation. And the table reservations consist of different genres or types of books. And they can sample books for five minutes at a time with a menu that's kind of like a guide. And then after we do that, they then have an opportunity to go back to something that they might have tasted to see if it's going to be a good fit book for them or not. And then they have the ability to check that out. If they end up reading, I usually say 25 to 50 pages and they are not truly captivated by that book, I encourage that book to come back to the library. That way they can find something else that they want to read. Um, Today's authors are writing books for a generation of readers. Um, and this, these authors are writing books that are relevant to what is happening in our world today and what our kids are experiencing today. So they're very different books than from when I was in fifth and sixth grade. Um, these topics, some of them are current event topics. Some of them are challenging topics but they are writing for readers. So readers can um, work on their critical thinking skills. They can work on um, empathy, empathy, social emotional skills. Um, I, I do feel that finding a good fit book for each reader is imperative. It really is necessary for every child to find something. It doesn't have to be in our school library, it could be in a classroom library, but it's really imperative to me that every child has something that they can connect with. Um, a lot of times I will buy read-alikes. So um, Dog Man by Dob Pilkey is a graphic novel and this book showed up as a read-alike in a database that I will often lead the kids to. It's called Novelist K through 8 Plus. It's a subscription database that we have. And you can type in the title of a book that you like, and it will list read-alikes on the side. And it will give the child an opportunity to kind of look at the read-alikes and see which one they might enjoy checking out. And then we will help lead them to that book. Um, when books are purchased for children, the Bedford School District selection policy is um, followed. 
professional resources are consulted. I know several of us have talked about this. Award winners are reviewed. Um, and narrative elements are considered, chapter format, readability, themes, and content. So books are not purchased just willy-nilly. There's a lot of thought that goes into our book selections for our students. Um, our Destiny catalog is online. It is transparent at any point. A parent and caregiver can go in with their child and look at the catalog to see what's available. I encourage this um, often in our principal's news that is put out because I think that parents should be talking to their children about what they are reading. Um, these open lines of communication help to form connections they stimulate comprehension and creativity. By chatting with children about what they are reading, it also allows the adults in their lives to make sure that they are reading a good fit book. And I truly believe that there is power in reading and sharing stories. Thank you, Julie. So I, I actually have seen you in action. All the things that she said, of course, are, are very true, and I appreciate it. I think one of the hints I'd like to give to community members, and particularly families, is so all of us with young kids, we always would read to our kids before bed, right? I think that's a pretty uh, similar tradition in most houses. But I found as my kids got older and they were reading books, I started reading the same ones mm -hmm. as them. Um, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you some of the ones I'm reading right now by my older kids, but I read them. And what's interesting is um, it gives you sort of a window into what they're reading, what they're thinking about, and it gives you a jumping off point to have conversations about things you might not otherwise have. Um, and sometimes it's lighthearted and sometimes it's a little deeper. But I do think um, our librarians and our schools really want a deep partnership with families when it comes to the books their kids are picking. And um, so just to go through that backpack or ask your, your uh, student, hey, what are you reading at, from the library? What was the book you picked? Uh, there is no one who's going to question you asking that because, uh, you know, parents are the first teachers for their kids and we want to make sure you're comfortable. So I really appreciate the shoe uh, analogy because it's true. I think each of us has had a book that we've picked up and we read it for a few minutes and it's still on our bedside table and others we tear right through. So anyway, thank you very much, Julie. I appreciate that. Um, okay, next, last but not least, I have a question for Josie. Josie is uh, from Memorial School. Uh, so, uh, Josie, the question is, uh, uh, how do students know when the content or material in books is above or below their level? So what do we do, particularly at the elementary level, to help kids, you know, instead of us just always picking for them, how do they sort of learn to know for themselves what sort of a just right or a just fit book? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm newer to the librarian profession, but my background is... In, as an applied linguist, so I'm fascinated by the language in books, and um, I take pride in curating certain literacy materials that all children can access, since I have that special education background um, as a speech pathologist. And my background is also in dyslexia studies. So um, one of my biggest goals is to make sure that the library is a welcoming space, not just for kids who consider themselves readers or book lovers, but almost especially for that kid who comes in and, and challenges me by saying I really hate books. Um, so I think just like an adult going to a bookstore trying to figure out is this book right for me or not, children have to sort of learn that process. Um, and it's never a perfect science and that we don't have a perfect formula with exactly what book is gonna resonate with us. It changes as we change as individuals through the lifespan. Um, but at the elementary school, since we have that wide range of ages from kindergarten through four, we start at that kindergarten level with being very concrete, doing the just right books, the good fit books. How many words did you understand in that page as a guide of is this something that's um, readable for me or not? But um, the other thing to take into account is that kids need a lot more guidance at the elementary level. Um, being a librarian, I've, I've come to learn is uh, as equal part science as it is in art. So there's the science of curating, curating information and, and seeing the gaps in your collection and having this 
living, breathing sort of place you're managing, but it's also an art in connecting to your patrons and figuring out the things that they're looking for, sometimes when they don't even know how to put it into words. Um, so when students come to me and they're K1 and 2, they usually don't have a sense of what's right for them. And I think we tend to step in and curate materials um, more closely when they're that young. So when we start with kindergarten, I might choose a wide range of picture books for them to choose from. They don't have free reign of the library at first until we've had conversations about how to choose books that are right for you. Um, we start sort of opening that. We give explicit lessons about what fiction is, what biographies are, what nonfiction is. Um, and they start to learn about the different genres. And some of them will say, I really like nonfiction books. I really like information books. Or I really like fantasy stories. I don't really want to read a nonfiction books. They start to learn about who they are when they do that and, and why certain things stand out to them or not. Um, so it's a long-term teaching process. Some kids take to it more readily than others, like with everything else. Um, some kids quickly learn, this is a series that I would like and here's why, and they can vote and they can verbalize that. Other kids, I see them sort of walking around the stacks and they're not sure. And those are the kids where I really feel like I need to make the time to go have a conversation because talking to them and getting to the bottom of what they like or don't like is the difference between them feeling like they're a part of the library or not. So just this morning I had a kiddo, he's walking around, I don't really want to get a book today. And I, you know, always act very dramatic when that happens. So, oh, you're breaking my heart. How could you say you don't want a book? Let's sit down and talk about it. And so he says, well, I don't really like any books. And I said, that's fine. So what do you like? And so he starts to tell me, I like to play video games. Okay, well, we have some video game guides. I don't really want to get that. Well, what else do you like to do? Oh, nothing. Well, do you watch TV? Almost everyone watches TV. So he says, yeah, I like to watch TV. And then I tell him, I ask him, what do you like to watch? And he says, well, I like cooking shows. My sister and I watch a baking show. So I go, oh, do you like baking shows? Do you like to eat or do you like to bake with your sister? And he's able to tell me, I really like to watch shows and, and eat mostly what other people in my house bake. So I can then say to him, you know, I just got a book called The Donut Fix. And it's actually about this kid who starts his own business and he starts to bake. And it's like really funny and it's got a spoof on a cooking show. And he says, yeah, I think I would like to read that. So he walks out with this book and it's honestly magical. It's like nothing I've ever done before because sometimes when we're teaching and I've been on the other end, it takes a little while to see that light bulb go off. But as librarians every day, when something resonates with a child, it feels really personal. It feels like you saw me, you saw what I like, you made it a point to have the stuff I like in here, and you took the time to talk to me because you really want me to have the things I want. And I think there's something so special about that, that that's the process we go through. We, we say, I see you, I, I see you as an individual, even when I care for everyone in this building. When you walk in, you have my undivided attention. I always say that to the kids. Um, you notice when you come up to me and you ask me for a book, everything else stops because I'm here to listen to what you like and I'm here to find you something that helps you love to read. And so they start to see that. They start to see that as a safe place for them and they start to know more about who they are and more about what they like. And over time, as they move into McKelvey and Largio in the high school, we now have this person who has had a chance to figure out the things they like and have those things and their choice made important. We've said, we put the things you like in this library because what you like and who you are is important. And then when they walk into that high school library, we're not holding their hand anymore. They're now individuals who are really close to adulthood who walk in and select the things they want on their own. Um, but I see it as this gradual process of helping kids figure out that their voice, their interests, what they like matters, and the library is a space where that's honored and that's treasured by all of us. 
Uh, Josie, that's great. Thank you so much for that. Um, you used the word gradual, and it, it made me think of this idea of sort of this gradual release of responsibility. And you talked about how you may select all the books at first for kindergartners and help them understand before you release. But you're right. By the time they get to middle school and high school, they may be seeking guidance about the kinds of things they like and where can I find it. But they're really making more independent decisions about what it is they've grown to like and how that that taste may have changed, or they may be introduced to something different. So I really appreciate that. Um, so we're getting close to the end of our time, but one of the things uh, that I would like each of you to just chime in on if you're prepared to, um, <laughs> if that's okay, and that's just one piece of information that you would like parents or community members to know, um, either about your role as a librarian or school libraries in general. What's one thing that you would want people to know? And so I don't know who wants to go first, but if you have an order, that'd be great. Sure, we can go down the line. So one thing I would like you to know about all of our libraries, and this has been spoken by a couple of us, um, all of our titles and all of our mater materials are online. You are welcome to go and view them at any time. And if your child brings home a book that isn't just right, our libraries are open every day. Just because your child doesn't have library class with us that day, they are welcome to come in and drop off that book and get a new one if they'd like. Our doors are always open. Um, I guess I would want parents to know that libraries are sacred spaces. They're, they're places where we can exchange ideas even if we disagree with one another. They're places where kids can have access to information. They're one of the few places in the school where kids get to have some choice and some say in, in what they read and what they learn. Um, it's a place for independent inquiry and to let kids challenge themselves or try things that they've never tried. Um, and they're welcoming spaces where everyone should learn about differences and similarities. They, they should be able to access uh, books where they see themselves and books that serve as windows into other people's experiences. Um, but libraries are also, in school libraries, uh, places where we're curating specifically for our community, and they're constantly changing, like it's been mentioned. Um, we take this work very seriously. I work with some of the coolest people I have ever worked with, and they're very passionate about what they do. Um, and we also really want what happens in the library to transcend just our spaces, to be continued in the classroom by teachers, and especially to continue at home. Um, so we're taking what we love, and we're putting it in the hands of your children, and they're taking it home, and there's nothing more exciting than us hearing that you read those books to your children, and that you got to know your children better by exploring what they're interested in. Um, so it's, it's a place where we can learn from each other and be connected and come together as a community. Um, I think what you're all saying has reminded me of something that happened in the library this week, um, which is related to what I wanted to say, which is that I take very seriously, and I know we all do, building lifelong readers and helping kids find themselves in books or walk in other people's shoes through books. and. Um, I know some people have different feelings about not, I think at this table, but in general about whether graphic novels are real reading or audiobooks are real reading or, you know, that a kid has to be reading a chapter book for it to be real reading. And um, I feel like it's important that we not judge that, right? That we not judge students' free choices um, because they do feel valued when we get excited about what they've chosen, even if it's not the same format that we would choose. And the story I want to share is the student who came in um, this week, he got hooked on the Lunch Lady series, which is <laughs> old, but um, we only own one book. And I've been meaning to buy them. I just haven't had time. And he came, well, we've been borrowing them from you. Yeah. So <laughs> I, he comes in, and he's so excited. And he said, my dad and I loved this book. We read it together last night. And now we need number two. <laughs> and I said, all right, well, I'm pretty sure Memorial owns them. So for now, we'll borrow them. 
And as soon as he finishes them, he comes back in for more. And so just watching how excited he is to be sharing this with his dad, right? And that this is a great moment for the two of them. Like it's just such a great part of our jobs to see kids in that way, yeah. Um, I think mine is more of a logistical comment um, on how we all function as a vertical team mm -hmm. across all of the schools. Um, once a month we do get together, um, not because we're required to, but because we want to outside of school hours. And we all meet as a vertical team and we do that because we're passionate and we care about what we're doing and we want to deliver a cohesive library program across the district to all of the kids in town. And I, I think that's important for people to know that we aren't islands mm -hmm. in the district. Like we really try to put together a K to 12 library program that benefits every kid from the moment they walk in our doors to the moment that they leave us. I would like to piggyback on that. Um, I think it's important for the community to know that um, we are trained professionals. We have gone to school to get our certification to be school librarians. And we all take our jobs very, very seriously. And curating and um, providing access to students is something that we are all very passionate about and we are trained to do our jobs. Yeah, I think you all have said everything beautifully. Um, it's hard to add something new. Um, the only thing I think I can mention that might be a little, just something else to think about um, is that we need to give our students credit for the information that they have um, and how um, students know a lot and I think as teachers we're lucky that we get to work with students every day but a lot of the times like as Julie mentioned like finding the right fit and finding books that speak to them um, students often have an idea of in the in the middle school level in seventh and eighth grade they often have an idea of what they're interested in and if they and if they don't as Josie mentioned we talk with them and help them so I mean, we, we have chosen these career, uh, the career um, as a school librarian with a purpose. We all are very passionate, and we do this job with love, and we do it with um, a lot of compassion and empathy as well. So I think um, just knowing that as, as we listen to our students and, and as we get to know them and their interests and their passion, whether it be sports or whether they love um, graphic novels or they just can't like I have students who just go to the graphic novels they walk in the door and that's why they're front and center when you first walk in the library it's the most popular section and not judging like like it's so hard to get a kid to like I'm like hey have you considered like adventure have you considered some nonfiction they're like nope I've got my I've got my section I'm reading this whole section I'm good so I think just recognizing where students are at and giving them credit for where they're at, having conversations with them, not being afraid to talk with them about what they're reading. Students often will share things if you're willing to listen. And so I think that's been my lesson in, in this field of work. And it's been, our jobs are really fun. Like I often say, like we have the best job in the school. I think we're super lucky that we get to meet every student and every teacher. Um, and so I just feel fortunate and, and I feel like we're all very approachable if, um, yeah, if there's any questions or concerns. Great. So uh, I want to thank, um, ladies, uh, thank you for being here. Um, for anyone who has uh, watched the entire program, it's clear that we have uh, some highly trained, very caring professionals uh, in our schools. Um, and so I'm just very grateful that they had the opportunity to, to share today. I think my takeaway for families, um, first and foremost, is that everything you heard today was really helpful, I think, and it sort of gives a window into what happens uh, behind the schoolhouse door every single day, uh, particularly the stories that we heard about the individual interactions with kids, and, and that happens each and every day in, in our schools, and I think that's really good to have in the forefront of our minds. Um, and then secondly, um, the other piece I think that's important is if you have questions or concerns, um, pick up the phone and call. Uh, if you have a child that doesn't like to read or is having a hard time finding a just a, a good fit book, um, you can of course call your child's teacher, but you can also call the school librarian. Uh, they have a lot of tips and tricks up their sleeve, and sometimes um, 
when a student hears something from an adult that isn't mom and dad, it sometimes sticks a little <laughs> better. Um, so it just depends on the situation. But uh, with that said, I want to thank um, all of our librarians here today. I want to thank BCTV for hosting us and thank uh, those of you who watched uh, for having us today. Thank you.